All right, as we get started, let's go and take a look at your homework. Page 31, questions 18, 19, and 21. Question number 18 says, how does alpha decay differ from beta decay? There's a few different directions you could have gone with this, but to Kendall, what did you put for number 18? Okay, the, uh, the energy levels in the, um, in the radiation itself is a difference. Okay, what did you have for this, Audrey? Um, alpha decay differs from beta because beta decay emits a high energy particle of two protons and neutrons, and then beta is when the nucleus is down part changes between up Okay, so you went ahead and talked a little bit about the process itself. Another thing that I will emphasize in the lesson is what the atomic number does, depending on the different type of decay. So we'll look at all of that here in a little bit. Number 19, what particle is virtually massless and travels near the speed of light, and how is it discovered? Uh, what did you have, Kendall? Um, the neutrino. Mm -hmm. The neutrino is a massless particle that travels near the speed of light. It was discovered by Wolfgang Pellini in 1931 when he saw a neutron within the nucleus release high speed electron and changes into a proton. Okay, all right. And uh, conservation of energy there would say that, okay, there's got to be some particle that was just released that has a great deal of energy to compensate for the loss of mass. And that's when he said, okay, there must be something, we'll call it a neutrino. Uh, number 21, what are antiparticles? Um, what did you have for that, Audrey? Antiparticles are combined electrons and positrons that have the same characteristics but opposite charges. Okay, and you gave the example there of the electron and positron, but in general, any particles that have the same size characteristics but their spins and therefore their charges are opposites of each other. Very good. All right, let's go and review some things we talked about in our last couple of lessons. We've been looking at, um, uh, more, most recently, the atom, and we said the atom is, how, how do we define that? Do you remember, Michael? Um, the building blocks. The most basic building block of all matter is the atom. Um, what, do we, what is a molecule then, Audrey? Two, combined atoms. Two or more atoms that are chemically combined, good. Uh, we said that on the inside of the atom is where all of the mass is concentrated, and uh, what's in the, what, what do we call that middle part of the atom? Uh, Kendall? Nucleus. nucleus. What's in the nucleus, Michael? Protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons. So that's where the mass of the atom lies. So for all practical purposes, we would say that the little buzzy things around the outside, no mass, we call those buzzy things, Kendall, mm -hmm. electrons. And um, the, with those three major uh, subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. What are their various charges, uh, Audrey? Uh, the neutron is neutral. The proton is positive, and then um, the electron is negative. Very good. Um, we said that the protons and neutrons, then being in the nucleus, is where the mass of the atom is concentrated. So, how do we find, or how do we get the mass number of an atom, Michael? Basically, count the protons and neutrons. Now, you'll notice the numbers aren't exact, right, for two reasons. One, the atomic mass of a proton and neutron vary just a little bit from each other, and they're not both exactly one atomic mass unit. Also, we have to account for the fact that some substances could have extra neutrons, which would affect the mass. And so we have to kind of average those in to get the mass number that you would see on the periodic table, for instance. Um, what do we call a, an element or a substance that has gained, in most cases, neutrons and therefore has a greater mass than a normal substance of its same kind? Um, kind of an awkward wording there, sorry. Kendall, did you figure out what I was going for? A substance that has more neutrons than normal, therefore its mass is different from normal. Audrey? An isotope. An isotope. What is it? Isotope. What is an isotope? Testing your short term memory here. No, no short joke intended there. Um, something, something. Uh oh. 
Kendall? I don't know. <laughs> Helper, what's an isotope, Michael? Oh, Audrey. Listen carefully to what Audrey's saying now. Um, it has um, different mass and more neutrons than normal. Good. It's gained or lost. Usually, gained. It's gained neutrons. If you gain neutrons, you're changing the mass. That's an isotope. Okay, Kendall. Rewind. <laughs> All right. And uh, Kendall, what is an isotope? <laughs> you gain mass. Well, I don't, but a substance well, does. Substance does. Um, or an atom. It Oh no, oh no. Gains or loses neutrons, and therefore it changes the mass. Now, what happens if you were to gain or lose protons, class? It's a whole different substance altogether if you gain or lose protons. So that doesn't normally happen, uh, though it will happen in radioactive decays. We'll see in a little bit. But uh, normally you aren't gaining or losing protons. It's neutrons you're losing. That's an isotope. Gain or lose protons is just something else altogether. What if you gain or lose electrons for redemption, Kendall? Boy, do you need some redemption on this Friday. Her brain's like, I'm tired. My brain can't handle more. Weekend, I need weekend. Um, What's an ion? I don't know. No, it's not one of those days. It's, it's a type of atom. <laughs> What's an ion? It's an atom that has... Well, all atoms have electrons, or should have electrons, I should say. Michael, what's an ion? An atom with a charge. An atom with a charge, okay. And why would an atom have a charge? Kendall? It's okay. It has stuff. Well, just having stuff doesn't make it an ion. Um, Audrey? Well, there's two different types of ions. There are two types of ions. Do you remember the two types of ions? Can you steal any of your thunder back? I'm trying. She's trying. Um, okay, Audrey, back to you. Two types of ions. Cation and anion. Cation and anion. Right? Do you remember that from chemistry now? And from yesterday? Coming back. Okay. And so we'll let you steal some of your thunder back. Do you remember what a cat ion is? It's oh, I thought you liked cats. <laughs> then why would it be negative? No, no. Cation's positive. Now, I don't like cats, but you like cats. And you like cats. And, no. You know, pretend you like cats. Cations are positive. The other one's negative. The anion is negative. Okay. So, Kendra, what would make a cation positive? What would make an atom positively charged? Well, all atoms have protons. That's positive, but atoms also have... Well, yeah, electrons. electrons. And the negative of the electrons balances with the positive of the protons, so they're just normal most of the time. So what would make this proton, neutron, electron become positive? Um. Not, can you gain more protons to make it positive? No, because no, that would change it. So what's the only way to make it positive? Which one? Electrons. Yeah, neutrons don't change anything. They're neutral, remember. But electrons, what would happen with electrons to make the atom positive? Add, if, you if you took away electrons, that would result in a positive charge, okay? Mm -hmm. So an ion is an atom that has a charge, possibly because it has, mm -hmm. that are whoop, gone, lost electrons. The anion is negative. What would make an atom negative? If you add more electrons. Okay, so what is an ion? Coming back to the original question. Um, gain, or loss of gain or loss of electrons. Versus an isotope, Michael, which is? Gain or loss neutrons. Gain or loss neutrons, because you can't gain or loss protons. Okay, does that, does that help to clarify a little bit? All right. Oh, moving right along here. Um, so we said the mass number is the number of protons and neutrons together, right? And an isotope would change that or affect that. What's atomic number, Audrey? Um, change 
Well, it's not a change of age. Just what is atomic number? Um, the atoms. Uh oh. You don't know. That's the number of protons. Remember, we said if you change the number of protons, you're changing what it is. Well, the atomic number is what it is. Okay. That tells you based on the number of protons, that tells you what it is, and that's atomic number. All right. Did we study last night? Okay, we didn't. Okay. Just curious. You got like, yeah, but I also have five other classes to study for. Okay, just calm down, calm down. All right. <laughs> um, talked about a really, really, really smart guy yesterday who uh, who gets his name taken in vain every time someone else is stupid. Uh, who was the really smart guy we talked about yesterday? Came with this theory of relativity. Einstein, Einstein right? So somebody does something stupid. Way to go, Einstein. You know, try to put a key in the. Oh, well, can't get it in. Flip it over, it goes in the other way, Einstein. Oh, it does. You know, <laughs> taking this man's name in vain, we're not honoring the man properly. Uh, but anyway, Einstein, back in the early 1900s, came up with this theory of relativity as specified by one simple, well known equation. I think. Michael, is it well known enough for you to know the well known equation? Um, e equals mc squared. Excellent. And uh, what is this letter C, anyone? Speed of light, okay, so do you remember what the value of the speed of light is? Um, Three eight uh, meters per second, uh, the speed of light. And uh, so what are the M and the E? What do those stand for, Kendall? Mass and energy. Mass and energy. And so basically what he did was he showed the relationship as related to the speed of light, relationship between mass and energy, which basically says, hey, if you were to increase energy, what happens to mass? It increases. If you decrease energy, what happens to mass? It decreases as well. And so uh, we said a couple of implications of this were um, that if you were to make something go really, really, really fast, that would be having more energy, it would also gain mass. If you can accelerate an object near the speed of light, it will gain mass. In fact, then, that was how he explained how it seems that light streams or beams of light seem to almost have like little particles of light that exchange energy when they strike an object. And these little particles of light can travel through a vacuum at this elevated speed. What do they call these little particles of energy, these particles of light class? Photons. Photons. And then we also said that um, the uh, Protons and neutrons within the nucleus, remember, they're held together very, very tightly. They're smushed into each other, which is actually like negative energy, if you will, almost like a loss of energy, which causes a loss of mass. So that the nucleus of an atom actually has less mass than the sum of all its parts. The whole is less than the sum of all its parts. Don't answer that way in geometry, Michael. But for the nucleus of an atom, it's true. Do we remember what we call this phenomenon? Nuclear mass defect. Just a few examples there. Uh, we said that um, the current accepted theory of atoms is that protons and neutrons are actually made up of smaller pieces that fit together called, do you remember? I figured, you know, your dad being a little quirky, you'd remember this. Quarks, there we go. Uh, not quark, but quark. <laughs> quarks. And um, we have the up quarks and the down quarks and the positive two-third charge and the negative one-third charge. Now it all fits together and stuff. Protons and neutrons, we believe, are made up of these quarks. And because they're made of quarks, we have a special term that refers to protons and neutrons. Do you remember what that term is, Audrey? Starts with H. Hadrons. Hadrons. And um, the idea is that these quarks kind of keep the protons and neutrons together. After all, you've got down quarks in the neutron, they can attract to the up, up quarks in the proton, and so that's why protons and neutrons can still attract each other, even though the neutrons are neutral. But I said the problem was, protons and neutrons are these quarks, you have two positive quarks and a proton. They should be repelling. And two negative quarks and a neutron, they should be repelling, yet somehow they hold together. And so the, there, this theory is that there's this substance or this particle, if you will, that holds the protons and neutrons together. Audrey's laughing. I wish Kendall were. Kendall, okay, maybe there's a smile at least. Kendall, do you remember what we call the substance or the particle that holds the quarks together? Mm -hmm. The gluon. Okay, and um, so uh, 
did you like my story? Mm -hmm. It's very gratifying to see you laughing that hard. It means you liked my story. That, that sounds good. All right. Um, electrons, though, no quarks. Quarks, in a sense, are what give the protons and neutrons their mass. Electrons are too tiny to have quarks in them. So we would say that an electron, because it doesn't have quarks, is called, and remember, a lepton. I always think of like that uh, Lipton T or whatever, but it's a lepton. I don't know, T, electron, it doesn't actually go together. But anyway, lepton, that's the closest word I can think of to that. And we said there's a couple other leptons as well, the positron, the neutrino. We actually talked about the, both of those in the homework. Um, and uh, so we'll get to those here in just a little bit, but also would be leptons. Okay, so some terminology there. And that's where we left off yesterday. Michael, questions on what we covered yesterday? What was the story? You'll have to go back and watch the video, which you apparently didn't watch, because otherwise you wouldn't be asking me what the story is. All right, um, <laughs> next thing in your notes, antimatter. Antimatter, or you can say antiparticles. That's pretty good, by the way, with the balancing of the, uh, the uh, highlighter there, standing on it, that's pretty good. Uh, antimatter, or antiparticles. Antiparticles are uh, particles which have the same characteristics, same size, same everything, but they spin in opposite directions. And that opposite spin produces an opposite charge. So antiparticles, two particles which have the same size and characteristics, but opposite charges or spins. This antimatter, this antiparticle thing was something that was discovered when people began playing with radiation. Uh, there was this inexplicable uh, behavior um, of uh, radiation, gamma radiation specifically. They could pass it right through a sheet of lead. But they realized it wasn't actually quite going through undisturbed, but rather as this high energy of gamma radiation strikes the lead, particles were produced. An electron, which we know a lot about, and what seemed like an electron but it was positively charged, and it spun the opposite direction, or at least that's what they theorized must be happening. We refer to it as the positron, if you'll write that term down. The positron is a positively charged electron. Does it naturally exist, okay? It's uh, created, if you will, through, again, strange stuff like radiation stuff. This, uh, we call this pair production, when two antiparticles are produced, but the, the, the phenomenon would be this, that the, because they're opposite charges, the positron and electron, opposite charges attract, right? So as soon as they were formed, they would attract to each other, and as they struck each other, they would self-destruct and would turn back into gamma radiation. So you realize it's not the gamma radiation just going through the lead, but rather there's a pair production of electron-positron that then destroy each other and become ga gamma radiation again. We call this annihilation. This process whereby antimatter or antiparticles destroy each other and go back to the energy they were before. So annihilation, you see that term there on page 28, is uh, what happens with these antiparticles. They annihilate quickly and they produce a great deal of energy. Well, if you look over at page 30, and this was from your homework reading last night, imagine if we could artificially produce antimatter and use antimatter to create energy. I mean, you could power whole cities with just a little bit of antimatter. So this seems like, hey, you're talking about clean energy. This is great, right? The only problem is it takes a great deal of energy to produce antimatter. So in producing the antimatter, you're putting out just as much energy, so it really isn't, doesn't have, we, we aren't seeing the potential that well, we see the potential, we aren't seeing a way to capitalize on the potential because of how expensive it is and how energy uh, deficient it is to even produce the antimatter. There is an application of antimatter though, and you see the, the uh, implication there, positron emission technology PET scans use positrons. They would actually inject a, um, a substance into the body part that's being screened that reacts to the radiation and uh, use positrons to um, to get that imaging there. But uh, yeah, there's who knows? Maybe in 15, 20 years, maybe less, they'll come up with a way to efficiently create antimatter and then harness the energy from antimatter to serve you know, energizing purposes. But for now, it seems like we're pretty much stuck with coal 
and natural gas and oil and wind and solar. You know, there's a little bit there, not nearly enough, right, at this point, but wind and solar. Y'all driven out toward, um, uh, out toward Macon area by any chance along Highway 80, turns into State Route 96, and seeing the massive solar farm they've got going on there, trying to see can we power an entire small city, Butler is not real big, uh, but can we power an entire town with solar energy? And it's a bit of an experiment that they're trying to perform out there. Um, it's just caustic, it's expensive. Right, to maintain the solar panels. I don't know if you've ever driven by, like, oh, half of them are out of position because they're supposed to turn throughout the day with the sun. Like, half of them are out of place. They're not getting anything. And there's a lot of maintenance. There's a lot of cost to produce. And they still use fossil fuels in the production process. So are we eliminating fossil fuels? No. Even your electric car, right? Just plug it in, right? How clean is that? Yeah, but what produced the electricity to plug it in? Well, here in Columbus, hydroelectric power, right? Chattahoochee River, but most of the country, it's still gas, fossil fuels. So can we really get away from fossil fuels? Not yet, frankly. Anyway, um, don't wanna get political, so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, another thing that you see there in your notes is we're talking about different particle reactions. Uh, electron capture, kind of an interesting phenomenon. Electron capture. Now, remember I said the nucleus of an atom is incredibly tiny compared to the size of the atom itself. And the atom itself is tiny. The nucleus is that much more tinier, if you will. Um, most of them. But you know, as we, as we get on the periodic table, as, as we get these lab created, especially these, these uh, higher, you know, um, higher substance uh, elements there that are inherently unstable, you're now packing over a hundred protons and usually well over a hundred neutrons into the nucleus. The nucleus of course gets bigger and with these larger atoms with larger nuclei that are those inner orbitals, those inner pathways where the electrons are buzzing around, it is possible for the negative to be attracted by positive and get sucked in. And there's a reaction that can occur when that electron is sucked in to the proton. The reaction can neutralize and create a neutrino, and we're going to get to that here in just a little bit. But uh, they've, they've observed this happen. We call this electron capture when an electron is sucked into the nucleus from its orbital. Uh, also note that term orbital. We referenced this term yesterday actually in talking about how the electrons move about, uh, but the thought originally, remember, had been that there's a predefined orbit, kind of like as the sun goes around the Earth. Right? It's just, it follows the same consistent path. Um, granted, some of the orbits have a bit of a wobble to them, even in our solar system, but you know, for the most part, it's very consistent. Not so with the electron, but there are places where, levels where we would expect to find electrons. And that's called an orbital. It's a region where it's highly likely we would find an electron. A region where it's highly likely to find an electron. As the electrons sort of move about the outside of the atom or move around the nucleus of the atom. And again, the orbitals that are in closer to the nucleus is where this electron capture could be produced. And that's where the neutrino, I believe, was first observed is this electron capture. Well, if we neutralize the proton, granted, the electron has virtually no mass, but as it reacts to the proton and neutralizes, by the way, that changes to a different element now. If a proton has been lost or converted into a neutron, that energy then is released in the form of a neutrino. Um, and that leads us into uh, this idea of protons, neutrons changing, or the atomic number actually being lost in an element. We call this radioactive decay. Radioactive decay where the uh, atomic number of an element changes. Therefore, you actually change what an element is. That doesn't happen naturally, but it can happen in what's called radioactive decay. And again, this would all happen with your heavy atoms. So a carbon atom isn't necessarily gonna randomly turn into something else, though carbon-14 can decay into back into the carbon-12. Um, one type of radioactive decay is called alpha decay. alpha decay. And uh, your Greek letter alpha that Audrey and uh, Michael are familiar with from pre-Cal Kendall, that's, that's alpha. Uh, some people say it looks like a fish without the uh, tail and smile and little bubbles. Okay, um, So I, I can see where they're going with, with fish. 
I think it looks like an A that's a little bit scripty and stuff. Anyway, Greek letter A. Alpha decay. It, alpha decay happens when a heavy atom loses two protons and two neutrons. When a heavy atom loses two protons and two neutrons. These combined two protons, two neutrons, this is called an alpha particle. Now, now think about it. Two protons. What element has two protons? Remember from last year? Which element on the periodic table has two protons? You can cheat and look. Tonic number two. Helium. Yeah, helium. Basically, two protons, two neutrons, that's the nucleus of a helium atom, but no electrons. So basically, the alpha particle is a helium ion, it's positively charged helium ion, basically. Helium 2 plus, and uh, that sh shoots off of the atom. It's got a great deal of energy to it. And, um, but the key here with alpha decay is if you're losing a couple of protons, forget the neutrons, What's happening to the atomic number? It's going down. It's going down by two. Alpha decay, this is the key thing to know with alpha decay, is it drops the atomic number. Alpha decay results in an atomic number that lowers. Beta decay, Again, here's your Greek letter beta. It looks like a B with a little bit of a tail down there. A little bit more rounded, less squared on the edges. Uh, but your Greek letter beta, lowercase beta granted. Uh, beta decay occurs when a neutron randomly changes into a proton because of quark change. So a neutron becomes a proton due to a quark change. At least that's what they think is causing it. That's the only explanation they have right now for it. Say, well, one of the down quarks must have turned into an up quark somehow, which is why I'm not sold on the quark theory entirely, because there's so many things that don't make a lot of sense, but you know, it's the best theory we've got, so it's what we're gonna roll with. But when they think of down quark changes into an up quark, which turns a neutron into a proton. And uh, it also at the same time releases a, uh, a, a high energy electron. So I'm gonna say high and RG, that's energy, high energy electron, and it releases something that, well, it's not a neutrino, it spins differently. It spins the other direction. What do we call particles that have the same characteristics but opposite charges or spins? Antiparticles, we're gonna call it an antineutrino then. So it releases a high energy electron and an antineutrino. The high energy electron is called a beta particle. So once again, we get the release of a high energy particle, just like in an alpha particle for alpha decay. It's a much smaller particle, right? It's not even a helium uh, ion. It's, it's just a high energy electron called a beta particle. And you get the antineutrino that's released as well. But the key here is if a neutron turns into a proton, you just change the atomic number. You made the atomic number go up. So the biggest difference that I want you to know between the alpha decay and the beta decay is what's going on with the atomic number. Alpha decay, the atomic number is dropping. Beta decay, the atomic number is increasing. Questions on this? Questions on this? And again, a lot of this is uh, what we believe to be the case. We're not entirely positive, blah, blah, blah. Uh, book mentions uh, half-life if you took a large sample of these unstable elements that will spontaneously begin to decay. Um, how long does it take till half of the stub substance has converted to a different substance? And there's that there. Obviously, we already kind of pointed out the antimatter there on uh, pages 30 and 31. You read about that in your reading also. Um, and that wraps up chapter number two. Questions on that? Let me go back over the highlights, though, of this last section, which was a lot more of the theoretical. Again, it feels a little bit more like chemistry because we're looking at what we can't even see. We're trying to, quote, look at what we can't even see, and that's the, the, the subatomic level. Uh, but again, we believe protons and neutrons made of quarks, so they're called hadrons. Electrons, positrons, neutrino, antineutrino, all these things, they're not made of quarks, so we call them leptons. Leptons. 
Uh, the idea of the quark theory is that the quarks are what keep the protons and neutrons together, but what is it that holds the quarks together? Supposedly the glue on. Uh, there, is, there is a side of me too that as a Christian, I, I look at this, I'm like, how amazing is God to have designed everything and scientists still can't figure out how it all holds together? The Bible says, by him all things consist, right? God is what keeps everything together. Scientists are trying to discover what is this force that keeps it together? Why would even the quarks hold together? And the explanation is unsatisfactory, at least in my opinion. Well, you're, you're trying to figure out God himself. Of course you're going to struggle trying to understand. And, you know, there's two responses, by the way, to not understanding God. One response is, I cannot understand him, therefore he must not exist. I cannot understand the Trinity, therefore it cannot be so. Wait a second. If I could understand everything about God, I would be God. Right? If I could understand everything about God, then that makes me equal to or greater than God. The fact that there are things I don't understand is what makes him God. And it's why we worship him. And it's why we trust him, because I don't always understand, but I know he does. Right? The core of humanism is my mind and my reasoning should be able to interpret everything. And if I can't, then it must not exist. Because I'm so arrogant as to think if I can't understand it, it must not be so. Do you see, do you see the, the fatal flaw in the logic of humanism? Right? It, it, it's basically elevating oneself to the existence of God by denying the existence of God simply because we can't understand it. So again, I'm, I'm not going to take the approach here of I don't fully understand quark theory, therefore it must not be true. It may be. I've also noted, noted that in the last 120 years, theories have changed constantly, had to keep changing, simply because, oh, look at that. Well, if that just happened, that can't be true. Let's change our theory. Well, now what's the next best thing we can come up with, right? That's what a lot of this is. The quark theory, um, a lot of this, even with the antiparticles, the antimatter. Okay, we know it exists. Okay, we've, we've seen enough proof that antimatter exists. By the way, what is antimatter? Particles that spin backwards. Right, particles that are the same in every respect except they spin backwards of each other. So they would destroy each other. What do we call that process where they attract and destroy and release a lot of energy class? Annihilation. Annihilation. Yeah, it's a great word. <laughs> Annihilation. Uh, <laughs> Annihilation. Um, and, uh, and so it produces a great deal of energy. Um, what is that positive electron called, class? The positron. And again, that's formed when the gamma radiation goes through the lead. And then, of course, they self-destruct and the gamma radiation is released again. Um, we said uh, that as the electrons are buzzing around the nucleus of the atom, there's different places where levels where we say, okay, it's probably likely we'll get an electron here. And it's not as predefined a pathway where it must follow, but probably this area around the nucleus will find an electron. What do we call that region, Kendall? An orbital. And uh, the process whereby in a heavy atom an electron could be sucked in, attract to a proton, and uh, convert the proton into a neutron, release the neutrino. What's that process called? Okay. Well, no. Electron capture. Electron capture. Uh, alpha decay, remember, is where a couple of protons and a couple of neutrons zoom away. And that's that helium ion, remember? And so the atomic number drops down. That's alpha decay. Beta decay. What is it that they think causes the beta decay? Anyone? Mm, quark change. Quark suddenly changes. We don't know how that happens, but quark changes. And so all of a sudden, what was a neutron becomes a proton. That's what causes the atomic number to go up. And then it releases that high energy uh, electron called the beta particle. And uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of the gist. I, I'm not going to test and quiz too heavily on this stuff, only because by the time your kids are in school, they'll probably have a whole different set of theories. And so, you know, why be dogmatic about something that's very likely to change? But you do need to know the current accepted view. If you were to go into a STEM field, you'd want to be able to um, know what is currently accepted so you know what they're thinking. So that way, when you discover something that flies in the face of it, you can be the one to change it. Anyway, questions on that? All right. We're going to take a quiz at this time, and then uh, on Monday we'll be reviewing over chapters 1 and 2. Tuesday will be our test. Of course, that'll be in Lesson 12 for those watching on YouTube. Um, for now, though, if you would clear desks of everything except for a clean sheet of paper and a pencil and a pen. Clean sheet of paper, pen and pencil. There won't be any math on this quiz, so you can take it in pen. That would be perfectly fine. Clean sheet of paper and a pen. And a pencil. This is quiz three that we'll be taking now. Quiz three. 
First and last name at the top of your paper along with today's date, which is 8-19-22. 8-19-22, today's date. Pretty straightforward quiz. There is a, a blank. You need to fill in with the word or words or follow directions. Um, just answer the questions. Should be pretty straightforward. And uh, we'll end our video here. The only homework this evening is to be studying over chapters one and two over the weekend.